Hey everybody, Aaron Cowan, Sage Dynamics. In this video, we're gonna talk about zeroing optics on handguns. Recently, I put out a video, uh, you can find it, uh, previous videos that have been shown, on why you shouldn't slave your red dot to your iron sights and call that a zero, call that a red dot zero. And some people rose, uh, raised um, some, some good questions and referred to a previous video I'd put out in 2016 on zeroing, uh, basically the same topic as this video, zeroing a uh, handgun optic. And for the first time, well, not the first time, one of the uh, a rare occasion, and the fact that I was not specific enough in that previous video on zeroing optics, I talked about slaving the red dot to the irons as a starting point, and then I talked about fine tuning from there. But I didn't go into specific detail on what that fine tuning actually entailed. So some people got the impression that if they zero, if they slaved their red dot to their iron sights, they'd have to make some small corrections from there, and that would be a zero. And that could be the case. However, that's not the technique that I want to put out there. So I'm updating the video uh, so we don't have any confusion, at least for people who are coming to me for zeroing advice on, on red dot handguns. Now, I've been shooting red dot handguns almost exclusively for over five years now. Uh, I've got thousands and thousands and thousands of rounds done. I've zeroed uh, 25 of, uh, or more guns personally, and I've assisted hundreds of students in correcting their zeros or actually zeroing from scratch on their own gun. So I've got a pretty large sample size on what an actual zero is going to look like. Now, for the purpose of this video, we're going to be talking about the 25-yard zero, which is a zero I recommend. You can get by with a 10 or a 15. It's zero that I have used in the past, but I found that the 25 yard does the work that I want it to do at the distances I want it to work at, and my mechanical offset at those closer distances isn't really significant enough to warrant a closer point of zero. So for the purpose of the video, we're gonna be talking about a 25 yard zero, and we're gonna work our way through the process. Now the very first thing I am going to do is I am gonna slave the dot to the iron sights. And the purpose of this video, I'm gonna be using an Agency 17 lake gun with irons forward. Uh, but I will be slaving my red dot to that front sight post while acquiring an ideal sight alignment. That's a starting point. It's not a necessity. It's not necessarily a step that you have to do during the zeroing process. What I've found in my experience is it does help you get closer to your zero, so you're going to be able to establish your zero with less rounds fired. Doesn't mean you have to do it that way, but it does cut down on the amount of ammunition you're going to have to shoot. But as you'll see going throughout the zero process, uh, it's not somewhat something you, somewhere you necessarily want to leave your dot. So slaving the dot to that front sight post is the very first step. Now I'm going to be zeroing at the distance of 25 yards. However, there are some targets out there. Uh, John Dufresne, he's another instructor for Sage Dynamics. He also had his own, has his own company, Kinetic Consulting. He has a zero target that allows you to shoot at 10 yards for a 25 yard zero and it is a graduated target so on the target you'll see these little squares and those identify clicks so if you know you're three squares to the right that's three squares so on and so forth i'm sure you're probably familiar with the target similar to that uh, but if you're not going to use this type of zero you're going to zero the way that i do i generally use a one inch circle or a B8 type target in order to zero my firearm. So that's what I'm gonna be shooting on. I'll put it on a silhouette. My goal is going to be to shoot a five round group as tightly as possible in the center of that red circle. Uh, the dot size, depending on what dot size you're ultimately going with, can dictate how well you're able to do that. Now, what I found in my experience is like on the RMR, the 6.5 MOA or dots around that size, they tend to completely cover the center of that target so that red circle is going to be completely covered by your reticle which is actually isn't a bad thing it gives you a very easy way to maintain a sight picture and you're not kind of fighting with if you're new to red dots you're not fighting with that natural trimmer bouncing around in the uh, the, the the point of aim your desired point of impact uh, I will bench the gun. I'm, I use a simple bench, which means I'm just going to be able. To, I'm going to use a, a sandbag or something similar to give myself a resting support for the firearm. But I don't want to lock it in or vice it in any more than that, because what I found in my experience is the more stable you make the gun outside of natural shooting, uh, the more the zero can be affected when you actually take the zero from your your isolated zero and you actually shoot it independently. I've seen zeros be be off two, three inches because the gun was so artificially viced down for zeroing that when the shooter actually shot it naturally, organically, uh, their zero was affected. So for this purpose, I'm gonna bench it, but it's more of a relaxed rest. Uh, as you'll see, as you see in the video, it's not something that's, that's um, 
exaggerated or uh, dramatically unnatural or a dramatically unnatural shooting position. So I'm going to start that off and my point of aim for every group I'm going to fire is going to be the center of that B8. Uh, and that's where I'm going to start. But the very first step is slaving the dot to the front side post. You may say, well, well how does that actually help me? Well, it's going to get the gun close to elevation and really, really close to windage as far as lining the dot up with the bore axis. It's not gonna be true to elevation, but it is gonna get you really, really close on your windage. I'll be shooting this on the 25 yard target for every five round shot group that I'm gonna do. I like five versus three rounds because it gives me a larger sample size hit ratio. So I, if I need to kind of triangulate where my actual point of impact is, if my group's kind of wide, it gives me something, gives me a little bit more data to work with. Now. Optics vary. Some optics have different adjustments. The uh, optic I'm using for the zeroing process, and especially this video and most of the optics that I use, is the Trojicon RMR, which has, which has 1 MOA adjustments. Now, quick math in your head, 1 MOA at 25 yards, that's going to give me a basically a quarter inch of movement for every click that I do. Uh, this is important to mention because I found it on some optics, I've gotten into a frustrating place based on my shooting to where it's just slightly to the right or just slightly to the left and, and if I adjust to the left to correct for it, now I'm just slightly to the left if I adjust to the right to correct for it. So you may find in your adjustments that you can't get it as perfectly centered as you want, although there's a lot of factors that go into that. So if I have a really, really good barrel and I have a really, really good stable shooting position, you may actually be able to identify that. But shooting skill is definitely going to factor into how specific you want to be with your shooting. So once I've bisected my dot, slaved my dot to my front sight post, and I, some people would use a lollipop, I bisect and I work from there. That is not the stopping point, that is the starting point. That is not where I'm going to leave my zero. And I think when we fire this first five round group, you'll see why. Now. Once that dot is bisected, I'm going to establish my, my rested shooting position and I'm going to not use the irons again. I'm going to use the dot itself. I'm not going to co-witness. I'm not going to leave the dot bisected on the front side post because that defeats the purpose of the dot to begin with. I don't want all that clutter. So I'm going to use the dot relaxed, roughly centered in the optic window and I'm going to fire my first five round group. As you can see, that group is somewhat low. Uh, windage is pretty good. Uh, I'm gonna have to fine tune it. I'm not gonna fine tune it yet. I need to give it closer to where I actually want to be. Uh, the adjustments that need to be made, I need to roughly come up. I'll mess with the windage once I'm pretty secure with the elevation. At this point, again, the iron sights are no longer a factor in what I'm doing. Uh, some people may bring up like, well, okay, what is the point of aim, point of impact of the iron sights? Which is a very good point to bring up if we want to talk about co-witnessing, which is not something we're going to do on the handgun. But it does, it is helpful to know as a shooter, if you're going to use suppressor height backup sights, what their actual point of aim, point of impact is. Some guns factory are 15 yard point of aim, point of impact with factory sights. Some are 25. Uh, it helps to know what your manufacturer is actually quoting your gun at. Once you put suppressor height sights on a gun, that's going to change because it elevates the sights over the bore axis. So me personally, anytime I throw sights on a, on a gun, I'm going to shoot just irons only to see where my actual point of aim, point of impact is. I'll start at 15 to see if it's somewhere in there, and that's usually, you know, that's, that's definitely a possibility. Sometimes it's in between 15, 20, 20 to 25, but it's somewhere in that, that relationship neighborhood between 15 yards and 25 yards. So. I'll make my, my adjustments. I'm conservative in my adjustments because grand scheme of things, handgun ammunition isn't very important and I want my zero to be zeroed. So I'm going to make conservative adjustments. If I look at the target and I feel like, okay, I need to come up seven clicks, uh, I'm going to come up seven clicks only. I'm not going to add any to that, which is what I mean conservative, I mean specific. If I think seven, go up seven. So that's the adjustment I'm going to make and then I'm going to fire my next five round group. That definitely got me closer to where I want to be, but, and for some people that might be good enough, like, yeah, you're hitting under where you want to shoot. No, I want the rounds to go exactly where I'm aiming. So I'm going to go ahead and make another conservative adjustment, maybe just one click, maybe two clicks. Uh, in this case, I made two, and I'm going to shoot another five round group. That's better, but not quite where I want it to be. So, 
final five round group, hopefully the final five round group because of my conservative adjustments. Now you'll notice that, that I still haven't messed with the windage. At this point I would make, if necessary, corrections to the windage. If I got my shot group up to a point where it's hitting just left or just right, but the elevation is good, then I'm gonna walk my windage in. Some people try to do both at the same time, and I can I, I can kind of understand why you would wanna you know cut down an ammunition spent. For me, it's a very specific process, and again, handgun ammunition in the grand scheme of things isn't that expensive. So especially for, for something as, as unique as shooting an optic on a handgun, unlike a rifle, rifle is a little bit more stable. I think we can all agree on that. I'm gonna do the two things independently of each other if I can, unless it's a very small deviation. So I'm gonna fire this next five round group with my final adjustments. And that is a zeroed gun, or is it? Uh, the question that has to be raised is, if it's a carry gun, it needs to be zeroed with the ammunition you're gonna carry. If you're one of those people that, that, and not everybody's like this, but there are some shooters out there that do this, they're, all, they're a flavor of the month guy, the newest, greatest, self-defense ammo comes out, there's zero, zero data on it whatsoever, but they buy the ammo anyway and they chamber it. Okay, uh, check your zero. Uh, if you're gonna do that, you kind of enlist yourself and or actually volunteer yourself uh, to, to constantly changing your zero because you're constantly changing your carry ammunition. If you found a round that's tried and true, I'm a gold dot fan, uh, but I also have, you know, HST, they shoot very similar, but they're not the same. So if I was gonna switch out ammos, I would check my zero. Doesn't mean I have to make any changes, but it's something I'm definitely gonna check. Uh, for range ammunition, if it's a gun that's never going to be carried, then zero it on whatever range ammunition or at least what, re what grain you, you commonly carry. Uh, you shoot a lot of steel, you're not going to see a significant deviation between 115 to 124. But you may see a significant de deviation between 147 gold dot and the 115 range ammo you're shooting at the range. So don't zero it on the 115, zero it on the carry ammo. You may be able to find a range ammunition that performs comparable to your carry ammo. My experience, Prime 124 grain Prime or Ruag 124 grain uh, shoot very, very similar to my 124 grain Gold Dot. So that's that's a target ammo I'm, I'm comfortable using as far as, okay, that's how the gun would shoot. Once the zero is established from that, that resting position, now I'm going to shoot the gun standing at zero distance. The reason I'm doing this is to see if there's a significant deviation from the rested position to the standing position. You probably won't be able to shoot as tight of a group. Uh, if you shoot, you know, all bull on your zero, you're probably going to shoot 10 rings standing 25 if you've got a decent amount of practice to it and you really bear down on those fundamentals. But you should at least be able to hit nine or eight ring consistently, roughly elevation, roughly windage with the zero position that you got from the bench rest shooting. If you're not able to bench the gun when you zero, this is gonna be a very aggravating process. And that's why I recommend finding somewhere where you can actually, and most indoor ranges are gonna have a rifle lane that has a, sh a sitting bench. You can use that to zero your pistol. Uh, outdoor ranges, most outdoor ranges, predominantly go with sitting positions, at least public access ones. So you shouldn't have any problem finding a way to zero the gun from a sitting position. As far as shooting rests go, if you don't have one, they're pretty inexpensive. You can actually make them yourself. You can buy a, buy a bag of uh, lead shot or a bag of rice and wrap it in some kind of fabric and boom, there you go for your zeroing process. Um, sand works uh, also because, you know, sandbags. But that's basically working our way through the zeroing process. And it's better to be conservative than it is to be liberal in your adjustments, otherwise you're just gonna frustrate yourself. Some people will ask, well, how tight should the group be? Well, how tight were my groups in this video? One and a half, two inch groups. From a bench rest position, there's no reason why you shouldn't be able to, on a quality firearm with quality ammunition, be able to shoot one and a half, two inch groups. You should be able to shoot one inch groups realistically. Uh, and keep in mind that one inch is actually one inch. It's not one ragged hole. You actually sometimes got to take somebody and show them with a ruler that the bullets don't necessarily have to touch in order for the group to be a one inch group or a one and a half inch group or a two inch group, depending on what you're comfortable with and what the gun is capable of. Most OEM factory barrels on quality ammunition are gonna be able to shoot one and a half to two inch groups. That should not be a significant hurdle to overcome for the gun that you've chosen. If your gun shoots three or four inch groups, my advice would be to sell it and get something else. Uh, I can't really see why somebody would argue their way into defending a gun that shot that poorly. Uh, if it does and there's aftermarket barrels available, that may be something you're willing to pursue. But in my experience, most people, the OEM barrel outshoots the shooter. Uh, so aftermarket barrels are 
for replacement of uh, worn out barrels or if you need to add accessories like a suppressor or a compensator. Uh, but most OEM barrels, especially the newer generations of OEM barrels available from like Glock, FN, and, and uh, um, Smith & Wesson uh, perform very, very well. And an aftermarket would be, again, an option for a suppressor or a compensator only. The barrel itself is going to be super accurate. Uh, but you can't fix bad mechanics with, with, with equipment. So this has been the zeroing process, and I wanted to update this video because there was some confusion in the other video because it wasn't specific enough. Uh, slaving the red dot to the irons is just the first step in the zeroing process, and then we work our way slowly and deliberately through the process itself. Uh, this gun, I, I this this particular gun that I zeroed in the uh, the video is is a range and a student gun only. It need to be re-zeroed because I recently changed some uh, changed the battery on it. Um, so I shoot it on 124 grain range ammo. Again, if it was a carry gun, I zeroed on my carry ammo. And it's a little bit more of an expense. You may have to shoot 30 or 40 rounds, or maybe less than that, of your chosen brand flavor of carry ammunition. But it's definitely worth it because that's the gun that you're going to carry. So if you have any other questions on zeroing procedures or any maintenance procedures really in regards to MRDS on handguns, feel free to drop them in the comments section below. And I hope this clears up any confusion versus the old video, which I'm probably going to delete once this one posts. I'm Eric Cowan with Sage Dynamics. Train accordingly.